this specialty of pathology is absolutely linked to clinical findings. Dr. Michelle Heary, how are you? I'm good. I'm yes. good. It's so good to be back and talking to you. You are my first guest on specialty stories. And so I think a lot of students watching this live now would love specialty stories because, right, it's it's learning about specialties. And obviously a lot of students are doing this now because of COVID and you can't go into doctor's offices and volunteer and do all of that fun stuff. But specialty stories is a great way to also learn some more information. Yeah. Dermatopathology. Yes. A lot yes. of students are like, what the heck is that? It's right. like it's like this this like Frankenstein of a specialty. Like, where do you you're making up all these words now? Right. I Tell know. Me about it. You know, there are actually even physicians that don't really know <laughs> what we do. <laughs> so um pathology in general, actually, a lot of specialties don't understand what we do and they're mm -hmm. physicians, you know, and I really think that that's a disservice to our specialty and the fact that they're just not exposed to it in medical school. And that's, that's a, a big problem mm -hmm. because it pathology in general is vital to almost every specialty out there. Um, and it's good to understand what we do so that you have a better understanding of what we can provide to you um, and, and what service we, we actually can give you. Dermatopathology, um, and I'll kind of go into all the different types of pathology specialties, but dermpath is, is a rare bird in that you, ha you have to be um, really proficient in both dermatology and pathology of the skin. So dermato is skin. Um, Dermatopathologists um, have their board exam is is by both the American um, Board of Pathology as well as well as the American Board of Dermatology, and half of it is pure derm derm path or pathology, and half of it is pure derm. Um, this specialty of pathology, more than any of the others, uh, is absolutely linked to clinical findings. So many times. I wouldn't even be able to make a pathologic diagnosis unless I had the clinical picture, history, all of that. It would be a totally different diagnosis based on say the patient age or site. So it's vital that we have to know the dermatology, the actual clinical presentation in order to make the pathologic diagnosis. And I think a lot of people see pathologists as just in laboratory behind a microscope. Yeah but that's not really the case a lot of times. It's a stereotype and especially for derm paths, it's definitely not. Let me ask you a question because as you say that, right, having talked to a lot of pathologists, one of the biggest things that they want primary care doctors and other physicians to understand is that they can't make a diagnosis just by staring at a slice of, of tissue. Mm -hmm. And they need that clinical history. They need the physician to provide that. And obviously, as a dermatopathologist, you're oftentimes the one doing both. Why is dermatopathology so special? Why don't we have GI path and, and uh, oncopath? And like, why is there not a path specialty, subspecialty for every field? Well, there, there is. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of subspecialty um, pathologists. And, you know, as I, I'll go over kind of in my little, my little talk there, you can subspecialize. And there are a lot of people that do that. Um, there's GI pathology, there's neuropathology. I mean, it just goes on and on. But honestly, a lot of those, the subspecialized um, um, areas is, you, they're usually handled by general pathologists. Um, but there are a lot of places in academic centers that do that subspecialty but they're not doing the clinical aspect of it, right? Oh, and most yeah, dermatopathologists that, don't. Towards. And yeah. I will tell you, most pathologists don't, okay? okay? There are some that do, but you have to have additional training to that for that. You're either a dermatologist or you're a physician that has had extensive clinical training. You don't get extensive clinical training in a regular pathology residency. Yeah. You are not uh, mandated to do an intern year. You're not mandated to do any sort of clinical work um, with real patients, real live patients, at least. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm excited to jump into your presentation, see what we have rocking and rolling. And I'm, I'm sure the students want to really dig in and, and hear all about dermatopathology. Okay. So, all right. I'll, I'm going to share uh, my screen. So, dermatopathology. And again, I'm going to talk about kind of all realms of pathology, not just dermpath. So, honestly, this is kind of what people think about pathologists, at least in the medical community that we're all kind of these weirdos that you know we're just like freaks in the basement mm -hmm. um and that like the mug said this is not my mug but i have several kind of like this is i like people that under my microscope <laughs> um but honestly we are um kind of weird so when i was a kid and because i guess i'm old but my first uh, introduction to pathology with Quincy. I don't know if you remember watching Quincy on TV, oh, but the, Quincy, Adams, Quincy was the name? best. Quincy, Quincy was Jones. the best. Look at him. He was like yeah. on the autopsy yeah. table, just reading. But you know, there's a lot of um, shows and they all tend to be about forensic pathology, right? Yeah. That's like the sexy topic. Of course, my favorite Exiles and Scully, <laughs> who, who just happened to do autopsies, even though she wasn't a pathologist. But honestly, people, this is real life. You know, we are kind of weird. This is like, you know, our <laughs> our um, conferences tend to be lighthearted and we're all kind of quirky. This is me doing an autopsy and residency, like having fun. Um, but we're all just, you know, very collegial. We, um, we're not freaks. We go out, we have a good time. Um, I mean, some of us are freaks. But what is pathology? So Again, I I get this question all the time, even from other doctors. You know, what do you do? What what yeah. do you do? Um, I mean, we can be literal, like what does it actually mean, the study of suffering? But really, pathologists will um, look at the clues and make a diagnosis. So whether that's observing tissue, whether that's running a test, um, we basically will look at these clues to make a diagnosis. And clinical history is part of that. And that's the part where people don't understand. They want, they don't want to like bias us. I know that's something that I've heard a lot that, oh, I didn't write the history because I didn't want to bias you toward uh, a diagnosis. But mm -hmm. this is how we make the diagnosis. We take all the information and we put it together based on, you know, history, clinical exam, as well as what we're seeing or any tests that we're running on the tissue. And that's how we make the diagnosis. So the clinical history is vital. And in the end, we are the doctor's doctor. I know like your last guest that you said, surgeon's surgeon. Mm -hmm. Well, pathologists are the doctor's doctor. So we're answering those questions that you need to continue with your, um, your treatment, to guide your hand and and without us you don't really you know have a treatment course so that's really you know fundamental that people understand that pathology really is integral to every aspect of medicine and honestly i think it's one of the best kept secrets in medicine you know yeah. it's not as competitive as say plastic surgery um it's it's probably not as lucrative as plastic surgery, but we can get into that later if you want to. Mm -hmm. But I feel that, you know, this is kind of what I got into medicine for. I, I obviously I take care of patients, but I also think it's an intellectually stimulating um, specialty in that, you know, I am not working off this cookie cutter protocol. I am not, I am working on my, at my own pace to solve a mystery. And that's what I love. I can interact with people if I need help. I can, you know, talk to colleagues. It's, it's a very stimulating specialty. Also, now let me, let me yeah, ask you, one of the biggest myths or misconceptions that I hear a lot in talking to pathologists is that you are down in the basement and there is no patient interaction. Mm -hmm. Talk about that side of, of the kind of myth of what pathology is. So, you know, to some extent, depending on the subspecialty, that could be very likely. Many So many times pathologists are in the basement. I happen to like the basement better. <laughs> There's no sun. I don't have to worry about sunscreen. But, <laughs> but um, 
you know, because we're not as forward facing to patients, we tend to be relegated to areas, say, of the hospital that are, um, you know, in the basement or, or off some, maybe off site. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's unfortunate because really pathology should be kind of front and center because you are integral to every specialty. And I loved when I was in training, I loved it when certain teams would round and they wanted to see the pathology so I could show them and I can teach them and they can understand. And it wasn't just a report. Um, and there are some subspecialties that will actually be more patient facing. I definitely, um, uh, rounded or um, rotated in hospitals where the pathologist was the one doing the fine needle aspiration. The pathologist was the one doing the bone marrow biopsies. And there are some places that still do that where the pathologist is the one and not the, you know, the clinic clinician. Mm -hmm. So there are still some places that, that will do that, but usually the pathologists are kind of behind the scenes behind their microscopes, in their labs, and they are kind of disassociated from, from the patients, which is, is unfortunate, but that's just kind of how it is. But I, I feel like it, it could be something that could change. And even our own academy would like to, to see us more as part of the team, you know, even rounding and that sort of stuff. It's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that when you're so busy. And when you say academy, just just for the students, you you mean like the the organization that kind of oversees all of pathology, right, right, right. So exactly. Um, so okay. you know, our board, our College of American Pathologists, like the actual agency that that we're part of. Yeah, yep. got it. All right. So I think what's awesome about pathology, which is has a lot, you know, in common with other more um, competitive specialties maybe is that work-life balance. You know, pathologists, you know, they get in at eight or nine and they're, they're kind of done by five, you know, five or six. And unless you're on call, that's, you know, your pretty predictable day. You have your workload, you have conferences, if you are in the academic setting. Um, and then you get, you kind of wrap up for the day and you go home, you know, it's not like you're, like a surgical specialty where you're kind of always there and then and and that's really nice for people and i think that's also why they're probably you know it might attract more women um yeah but that's it's nice to have that you know you don't want to be married to your job at least you know i didn't yeah. um i think that's important the other thing is you know pathology is very diverse and it's not just the people there are tons of different people. It's not just like, you know, I hate to say it, but they're, they're not all like jocks from like the ortho or you <laughs> know what ortho. I mean? <laughs> right? It's not ortho. Um, not all nerds in neurology. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. Yeah, totally. Um, it's everyone. Like you have people like me, you have, you know, like foreign med grads. Uh, I mean, I am actually considered foreign med grads much Ross, yeah. but I mean like yeah. from a different country. Um, you know, it's as long as you have a pair of eyes and you can move your hands, you can you can do it. You know, so you can have many different people, and it tends to be a much older um, person that's in medicine as well. I think like the oldest people I've ever seen who are like 300 years old are still practicing <laughs> pathologists. You know, like you were alive before there was like a microscope, and you're still working, and it's possible. <laughs> Like it's seriously yeah. possible for that. Um, the other thing is you can work in a many different settings and that was really attractive to me. So if I wanted to be in the hospital, I can, I could be in an academic hospital. I can be a community hospital. I could be in a private practice. I could be solo. I could be in a small group. I could even work for biotech. I could work for the government. You know, I could do many different things as a pathologist and all the doors were open. Cool. Um, working with other doctors, I think was very important to me. I love, so my husband is a radiologist and, um, I love that sort of correlation with, 
with radiology, with findings. You know, many times when I was signing out as a resident, like say breast pathology or, or GI pathology, I would always look at the imaging and correlate it with, with what I was seeing. And that's a big deal. So when it comes to say like tumor boards and tumor boards is basically like everyone taking care of that patient, the oncologist, the radiologist, the pathologist, they all get together and they talk about the patient and what's the best you know, way to go forward to treat them. And you have that integral part in helping them determine the best course of action and best course of care for that patient. And I loved that part of it. So you're not just isolated at your microscope looking at slides all day, um, or you're not in the laboratory, you know, doing blood banking or whatever aspect of pathology you're doing. You're integrated into the entire team taking care of the patient. And honestly, beyond any other field, except maybe radiology, because they're doing a lot of um, artificial intelligence in radiology, and my husband's actually working on that. But um, the cutting edge technology and pathology is, is awesome. So we're doing so many things where we're integrating diagnostics and therapeutics, and it's really this targeted therapy, like individual to the patient, which is huge. It's awesome. And it's just getting better and better. And, especially now that we're starting to get AI and telepathology. It's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. When did you, yeah. a, a common question that keeps coming up is when did, when were you first exposed to dermatopathology? So dermatopathology, I was first um, exposed to it as a, I believe I was a third or fourth year medical student. And I think I was a fourth year medical student and I was doing rotations at UC Davis, University of California, Davis. And I did a dermatology rotation, which was fantastic. And I met one of the attendings who was also um, a dermatopathologist. And I started looking at a few cases, especially the ones that we would do the biopsies on so that I could follow through and, and look at to see what the pathology was. And I remember just sitting at the scope and literally falling in love because <laughs> <laughs> seriously, uh, not with the attending, but with the, the slide, you know, so you, you couldn't see the slide because your tears were, were flooding. <laughs> the, the oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I remember sitting there going, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I, I liked, I like derm, I think it was really cool, but the derm path is like amazing to me. And his teaching, you know, he, he was a fantastic mentor. Um, so that was when I realized like I, I wanted to do derm path. I mean, I love derm, that's great, but derm path was fantastic. And it was that marriage of both the pathology and the, and the clinical medicine that was, such a you know big thing for me have you yeah. always been someone it, on some level there's something about pathology where it seems like you have to be someone who just loves how things are put together right totally. Getting down literally into the micro of things do you think you've always had that personality and so when you were like oh like i can literally see how we are built um outside yeah. of an x-ray and how bones get put together uh do you think that was part of it Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, as a kid, I would take things apart just so I knew how they were and then put them back together again. Yeah. I was always the kid that was like asking why, you know, how does this happen? Why does this happen? And that was something that, um, you know, I didn't have that, that spark when I was going through, you know, pre-med and med school. I, I knew I wanted to do something. I, I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a trauma surgeon. I mean, we can always get into why I wanted to do that, but um, nothing was igniting that passion for me. Mm. And until I, I realized, oh my God, this is what I've been doing my whole life. I like, I want to get to the, the root cause, like the, the nuts and bolts of, of the disease of, of how things work and, and see it. And it, and it wasn't until I sat down at that scope that I had had that experience before. And it was really quite, it was really quite trans, transformative. And, and that's when I was like, this is what I want to do. And it was awesome. 
Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's keep so, going. I think it's important to understand what pathology is made out of. So there's two branches. There's anatomic, which means that you look at tissue and that's what I do. And then there's a whole bunch of things under that, you know, all those different types of um, subspecialty um, pathology. None of those are really necessarily um, board certified. So you don't have to necessarily take a board in those general um, um, subjects. They're all just kind of part of the training. And then the ones that I list below it, those are actually board certified. You have to do a specialty fellowships and get boarded in them. And um, obviously everybody knows about the forensic pathology and we can talk a little bit about it. That's like the, like the you know, most popular thing, yeah. um, which is really cool. I will tell you while I was going through training, I fell in love with my forensic pathology rotation. It was in Boston medical examiner's office. And I literally, even though I had my dramatic pathology fellowship lined up, ready to go, I was like, oh my God, should I change? <laughs> this is like, oh my God, I really wanna do this. But then I just, you know, it just, we can talk about that. It just affects you profoundly to work in that environment. Um, you have to be a def definitely a, diff a certain type of person to do that. Yeah, we'll we'll try to get yeah. Dr. Judy Melanick on, who wrote Working Stiff. Which oh is yeah, oh my God, that's so cool! You have her coming on. For, you We're gonna try to. I, I've had her on specialty stories. I'm I'm friends with her, so hopefully we'll we'll get. Oh her my on. God! So then I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Then there's this whole other arm of clinical pathology that's that's more working in the lab, and that's really where this cutting edge, you know, technology also comes into play where we're talking about molecular genetics and really this like targeted therapy, you know? So say someone has a lung cancer and we wanna see like, can we, should we put them on a particular um, uh, medication? Should we put on a, a, a certain chemotherapy agent? We're gonna actually do molecular testing to see if that patient would benefit from it. That's more of this targeted therapy. And that's amazing in 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 the world of you know, oncology right now what we can do to tell our oncology colleagues what the patient would benefit from and that's i think that's um, a big deal okay let's talk about the residency though so what is it like how how long is it what do you do so there are over 140 programs you know some are pretty small some are much bigger I wanna make this like a really big point is that for some reason, American grads don't tend to go into pathology. And I tried to sort of figure out why that would be like, is it just because of exposure? Um, is it because there's some sort of stereotype against pathologists? Um, I, I don't really know exactly. My guess is that it's the exposure that as a pre-med, um, maybe you're not you know, exposed to it as much, or even as a med student, it's not part of a core rotation. Yeah. So I don't uh, know. What about, what about I, I think a lot of people go into medicine for that hero aspect, right? I, I want to save people, I want to help people. And pathology, I, I don't think they're connecting the fact that they are saving and helping people by helping the team get to a diagnosis, the correct diagnosis that's going to lead to the the correct treatment, which will hopefully help someone and save someone. I, I don't think they're tying it together. I think they see pathology doesn't equal helping people. It's helping dead people, I think is what most people assume. Right, which is funny because that's like such a small portion of what yeah. pathologists do. Um, no, I, I, I think that's definitely, definitely part of it. Um, yeah. I mean, I know when I started medical school that I had the same thing. I wanted to help people, I want to put people back together again, all of that stuff. Pathology wasn't on my radar. Like mm. that was Quincy, right? That was like <laughs> autopsy. I totally get it. Yeah. Um, but if you're in it for the fame and glory, you're gonna get disappointed. And if you want, if you're in it for the medicine and you're in it to help the patients in any way that is meaningful, uh, then it should really be um a specialty that you should look at because that's pretty great um it's usually about four years i actually did a three-year track that was just 
the anatomic pathology. I did not do the clinical pathology part of it. You can choose to do that. So it was only three years. There is not an intern year included, like I said. So you don't have to go through hell unless you want to, which I did. Um, and most of your time in the first year, at least, is spent grossing. And I know people don't understand what that is. So you actually take, and I have a picture of it in a little bit, you actually take the specimen, whether it's bowel, whether it's a breast, a brain, whatever it is, and you cut it up. Did, did you mean to have alliteration there? Bowel, right? breast, Oh my brain. God, no, I didn't. That was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, you cut it up in a way that will um, give you the most information and the best information to make the accurate diagnosis and also give you other information like uh, margin status. Is, it, is, the, is the tumor out? Um, uh, lymph nodes, are the lymph nodes positive? So grossing is actually super duper important. It is also gross. Um, <laughs> like it's disgusting sometimes. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Um, but it's also, I think, super cool. A lot of the times, at big institutions, it's actually done by a, a pathology assistant or a PA, which is different than like a physician assistant. Yep. Their, their sole duty is to just kind of cut up the tissue in a way that gives the pathologist the information that they need. Um, so, but residents need to know how to do it themselves because that's part of learning. A lot of your day is, is actually looking at slides and then signing out, which means sitting at a double-headed microscope with your attending, going over the slides that you've looked at, and then they ask you questions. You know, what do you think? What is this? What is the cell? You know, what what is your diagnosis? And then you talk about it, and everything is a teaching point. So even on the most mundane slide, anything can be a teaching point. Something to learn, definitely. Something to learn. I love it. Of course, autopsy is part of it. In the um, current guidelines. Every resident has to have, right now in COVID, 30 autopsies to actually graduate and take your board exams. When I was a resident, it was 50. We didn't have COVID. I think I had over 100 because I just, if there was an autopsy, I jumped on it. <laughs> I guess I wanted to do it. It's like my favorite thing is to do autopsies. You know, it's weird. Um, so that's a big deal. And not a lot of people understand that autopsies are different based on where you are. So there's the forensic pathologist, which you'll learn about, and they look at cause as, as well as um, mechanism, like how it happened. I, it, it, most pathologists in the hospital setting are just looking at cause of death. So they're not going to be looking at the things that a forensic pathologist necessarily looks at. Um, they're not going to be doing a lot of toxicology and all that stuff. This is like medical death. So, you know, you're looking at everything, the brain, the intestines, all, every everything. You're cutting it open, you're looking at it. Um, and you're taking little pieces of tissue and turning it into a slide that looks like this. And then you're diagnosing what the patient had underneath the microscope. And then you write this big old long report. And it's so fun. Um, the other thing is you guys probably learned about didactics in the last lecture of what that means is basically lectures. So kind of what I'm doing right now, talking to you about a subject, going over a particular subject. And in pathology, there's so much to learn. And even 40 year veterans, the more they know, the more they realize that they don't know things. And you're always learning in pathology, always learning in medicine in general, but there's always something to learn in pathology. Um, lots of conferences, like I said, so it's conferences with residents, conferences with different attendings, conferences with different fields, right? So there's radiology, pathology consensus conference, there's tumor board, there's so many conferences to go to that you're interacting with other people. And of course, you're also in the lab sometimes too, if you're the clinical pathology. So running the tests, learning how to, to run a lab, doing quality control all of these things. What I thought was awesome about pathology is that you get time to do some research as well. And that's super important to, you know, get published, to 
really kind of follow through on what's um, interesting, you, you know, interests you, and you have the time to do it. So that's what I loved about my residency is, you know, if you want to do something, do it. Okay, put put a put something together. We have money for you. Let's you know run your research. Um, something that when I was a chief resident at UMass, I really wanted the residents to really get into the habit of basically being an attending so that when they finish residency, they felt more comfortable being on their own. Because I noticed once pathology residents graduated, they were like, you know, freaked out. Like, how do I, how do I, you know, do anything? How one day I'm a resident, the next day I'm attending. <laughs> and surprise. like, I don't know anything, <laughs> like surprise. Um, and that's why a lot of pathologists will do multiple fellowships to try and get, you know, comfortable, but I'm like not down for that. I wanted, I want to do my training and I want to practice. I don't want to stay in, in, in this like constant loop of doing fellowships to maybe feel more comfortable. I was really pushing for residents to get that graduated responsibility to learn how to be an attending, to think for their own self and really kind of be motivated to do that. Part of residency, of course, is being on call. And call means doing frozen sections and not get into that kind of what that means, but that's a big deal. That's when the surgeons in the, in the OR and they have a tumor, they're trying to resect and they wanna know if they have it all out and they'll send it to you to tell them, do I have negative margins? Do I need to keep cutting? This is a big deal when it comes to things, say like brain tumors yeah. um, or, you know, uh, whipples, which is basically taking out like your pancreas, you know, for pancreatic cancer. This, this is a big deal. Um, and they always take the credit, surgeons do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone has questions, but. Keep going. Um, we got, okay. we got lots of lots of uh, ones that we've we've covered already or things we can pick up. As OK, well. OK. So, you know, I get, um, you know, I'm in, on on Instagram. I don't have a huge following, but um, you will. It's know. All, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but I get a lot of people sending me, you know, direct messages. Um, you know, how do I how do I get in? How do I do that? How do I get Durham path? And so what's a good way to start out? Well, first of all, you're not going to be a strong applicant if you have no prior experience, you have nothing showing that you have any real interest in pathology and people are going to see it as your backup. Yep. And that's never a good thing. And so how do you get some sort of, you know, get involved at all? So you can definitely go into one of the pathology societies and sign up. And um, there are a lot of online things now. I and mean, it's tough because everything is online. And, you know, it's hard to sit down across from like a mentor and, and look at slides or, you know, go see patients. Or, you know, it's, it's really hard. But you can do what you can, you know, online tumor boards. Even, you know, contacting um, a residency program and maybe even getting kind of matched up with a resident that you could at least, you know, talk about things with. Um, go to their online presentations and hopefully we'll be able to go in person at some point soon. Um, and then if you were necessarily able to, like say if you're a pre-med where you have a, a medical school at your institution or you're a med student, you know, try to rotate, do some sort of rotation in pathology. There used to be something called a post-sophomore fellow, which as a medical student, you actually take time off after your sophomore year, your second year, and you do a year of pathology. And a lot of the times it was actually surgeon, like people who wanted to go into surgery who would do that. So they had a better understanding of pathology, which is integral into, in, in the world of surgery. One of our post-sophomore fellows at, at UMass was actually fantastic. And I think was just as good as not, if not better at diagnosing things than our, our first year residents. And it's a fantastic way if you wanted to take time off to do research, to get you know, experience, and it might even get you a good, um, you know, 
uh, specialty like say plastic surgery or, or, or general surgery or something like that, or of course pathology. Um, but this is a great way if you rotate just to get those letters, to get some sort of um, exposure so that a program will, will say, okay, they actually are serious about pathology and it's not just you know, a backup plan. So what do we do? So what happens to that specimen once it's taken out of the body? So it, this is the grossing table, right? It's gross, it's disgusting. Basically you have, you have someone who is cutting the tissue up and this is probably a PA. They're dictating. Can you guys see my cursor when it's moving? Yep. Okay, so the person, okay. I don't know if everyone else can. So they're actually dictating, they're saying, they're, they're giving detailed um, measurements. They're, they're talking about the color, the texture, what they're seeing. These are all very important things. We will even take pictures of the specimen as well so that you know the surgeon knows and it's documented if it's a very interesting case. The pathologist who's signing the case out knows what it looks like. And you describe it and then you cut it up into little tiny pieces about the size of a nickel in each of these cassettes and nice. you put it in formalin. The formalin is that get used yeah. to the smell. Yeah, so um yeah, you do. <laughs> um obviously you shouldn't have very much of it. Um yeah. it is a carcinogen. Um I will tell not, you not though, of formaldehyde, but just of of the gross, the gross parts. So you get used to it. I mean, you get yeah. used to anything, right? Most of the time it's coming to you already in formalin. So you're not having that like strong blood and all this other gunk smell. Yeah. It's mostly the smell of formalin. And you're we, working we can in keep a hood. alliteration going with blood, bowel, and bile. Right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> the other thing is you are working in a hood. So this is actively this area, this grate is pulling up all of that um, formaldehyde, their formalin and, and the smell. So it's not that bad. Um, it's kind of like, it's working in a fume hood almost. Yeah. But yeah, you, you never you never really get used to it, but enough, right? Um, I will tell you though, as a side note, I used to teach anatomy when I was a, a grad student and, and actually as a med student as well. And the smell of the formaldehyde is actually an appetite stimulant. I don't know if you oh, knew yeah. that. Oh yeah, yeah. We did would you always know that? Go, we, we would always go out for, for dinner after hanging out. Oh dinner, my God. Uh, I would yeah. always get so hungry for shredded beef. I know that's horrible to say, <laughs> but it's, it's serious. So, and this is probably why in pathology, pathologists love, love equating what they see in terms of food. Mm. I don't know if you know that, but if there's a lot of pathology terms that wrote that revolve around food. And I have a feeling it's because of that, like formaldehyde, it makes you really hungry. I don't know. I'm already <laughs> getting hungry, hungry thinking about it. Yeah. So you put the tissue in these cassettes and you actually put it in a tissue processor. This is important to know because it takes a while to get your pathology report. And people always want to know why does it take so long? Because they think it's like, a blood test. You just like throw it into a computer and it spits out the answer. Mm -hmm. Not the case. It takes time. It takes about a day to fix the tissue. It takes a day to do the tissue processing where you're actually, the processor is exchanging the water that's in the cell and it's going through a series of changes where it's changing it to alcohol and different, different concentrations of alcohol. And then it's putting uh, paraffin in there. It's actually wax so that you're able to make this tiny, tiny, tiny little cut. You embed it in wax as well. And then you cut it with something called a microtome and it cuts the tiniest, thinnest, thinnest, thinnest ribbon. And it's actually about four microns. And if you don't know what that is, your hair, one hair is 50 microns. So it's doing a, the tiniest, so it's one cell thick. And that's what you're looking at when you're looking at a slide, you're basically looking at one cell thick. And this is what it comes out looking like after you stain it. And that's where you make the, the diagnosis. So it takes a while to do that. So what do you do once you get the slide? Well, that, that's the microscopic examination. I call it pushing glass. And that's kind of like the, you know, the street name for it. Um, what do you do? You make a diagnosis. 
the diagnosis we talked about is based on the history, the imaging. Many things make make you, you know, come bring you to that diagnosis. And what does it mean? Well, it can give that prognosis to the patient, right? So say in melanoma, it's telling you, you know, what type of melanoma you have, the stage, the grade, and then it's going to guide that treatment. And theragnostic studies, that's like basically the diagnostic and the therapeutic coming together for targeted therapy. So here, this, I mean, you got it, you got to love pink and purple in, in, in pathology because that's like your world. It's called hematoxylin and esin, H and E. So that's like your, you know, that's, that's the standard. That's what you get. There's always other things you can do, other stains you can put on later. Those are all special stains or immunohistochemistry is what it's called. You're actually staining the slide to look for particular antibodies uh, or antigens. But this is a typical glioblastoma multiforme. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, a brain tumor. And this is melanoma. And then this is a, a GI or gastrointestinal polyp called a tubular adenoma. So this is the, the awesome part, which I loved to do as a resident was frozen sections. This is when you're on call. Um, and the surgeon is sending down a piece of bowel and there's tumor in it. And he's like, I want to know if it's free, if it's clear or all right. So I can, you know, close the patient up. And so they send you this piece of tissue and they throw it at you and they say, tell me. And you're like, okay, cool. We need to know if the tumor is out because this is the surgical margin. And this is what you do all day when you're on frozen section service. You're just telling people either what type of tumor it is, and sometimes they don't know, and they're sending it to you for an actual diagnosis intraoperatively, or they're let, they ask a question, is it out so I can close the patient? And so it's really cool. You take a little section here. This is the tumor. This is the margin. You mount it on this block. You cover it with a media that freezes, but keeps the cells from the actual cells themselves from crystallizing so that it would look weird under the microscope. The water keeps it from crystallizing. And then you cut those tiny sections uh, off of the frozen tissue and you immediately look at it. So this is different than that long process that takes like a couple of days. This is quick and dirty and it also looks quick and dirty. So it's not like beautiful histology on the slide. So it's a little bit harder to sometimes to interpret, but it gives you your answer. So not everything can be a frozen section. So I'll just do a little bit on osteopathy so that I already kind of went over a little bit already, but I know that you're gonna have someone else on there. Like I said, my favorite. It was honestly my favorite. This is my my shirt, the dead to teach the living. Nice. Um, so <clears throat> this is really where most pathologists that work in a hospital will do autopsies. And I think that um, it's important to know that it is a small portion of your daily duties. Um, and it may only be like every other month that you're on autopsy service, but it's definitely part of it, but it's not everything that we do. It's a very small portion of pathology, um, unless you're a forensic pathologist. So I do have one autopsy case that, um, that's like the hospital type of case. And so this is what we would see on a typical autopsy service in the hospital. Um, young woman dies during surgery to move clinically, diagnosed giant hepatocellular adenoma, and adenoma is considered benign, okay? No other risk factors, okay? All of a sudden dies. An autopsy is gonna be performed in that case. She's young and sudden death. And this, this is what I love about autopsy is that you're answering that question. Like you're getting down to that root cause. You're, you're going through everything and you're finding, uh, you know, this, this finding. Many times in autopsy, we don't have a finding for the death. And it's sad, but most of the time it's just like, you know, heart attack or arrhythmia or who knows. But in these circumstances where we actually can find an answer, it's so gratifying. In this case, she actually didn't have an adenoma. She had a hepatocellular carcinoma. And then she had little emboli that went all into her, her vessels. 
and they just call caused massive infarcts everywhere and she died from that. Is there a specific reason why this happened while she was undergoing surgery? Or do you think even if she wasn't undergoing surgery, this potentially was going to be get triggered? It was pro- potentially going to be more. triggered anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if anyone wants to know like how I got to where I, so what's my path? So I was at UC Davis. I was like a super senior because I did um, a dual um, majors. I don't know why. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Like, okay, whatever. Um, so bio sci and poli sci. And I got into um I got into research while I was there. And I wanted to continue that research. I was actually um on a grant from the US Navy. I worked with marine mammals and doing virology. It was really cool. And I stayed on and I did a graduate school there. And then I even was like a medic on the ambulance because I was like, let's do this. It sounds like fun. And then finally, I was like, okay, I want to go to med school. I always knew I was going to go anyway, but I was like, now I'm ready to do it. And then, of course, I only applied to like Davis and then didn't get in. So I ended up going to Ross, which I thought was a great experience. Um, so for, for those of you watching this or listening to this, Ross being a Caribbean medical school considered yes. an international medical school typically doesn't set a lot of people up for success. And yet here you are, a dermatopathologist doing what you love you know it's all what you make out of it so i thought my experience um on the island with the first two years of med school were probably just as comparable i mean part of my graduate school was taking med school classes i knew what was out there i was teaching you know anatomy so i also knew the type of students i thought it was absolutely comparable to the first two years i ended up setting up all my own rotations after the first two years because I wanted to be in good places for my clinical experience. And I think that was the key for me. So most of my time was at Yale or UC Davis. And if I had gone to wherever Ross was going to put me, maybe it wouldn't have been the same, wouldn't have had the same contacts but that I was able to make. But that's not a, a normal thing. I mean, we can always talk about like Caribbean med school and all of that. I thought my Ross experience was was good. So yeah. I was happy with it. Ended up doing internal medicine here at, at um, one of the Yale hospitals, which was fantastic, St. Mary's Hospital. And then I stayed at UMass for uh, all, all the rest of the time. So I did my residency and fellowship there and then flew out to California the day I finished because I didn't want to be on the East Coast anymore. So... Like we said, Derm Path, there's really two ways to get there. You can come from Derm, you can come from Path. And if you come from Derm, you're basically always going to be looking at slides in your fellowship because you need to catch up. Um, and sometimes you're not even just looking at Derm Path slides, you're looking at, you know, say, um, breast pathology, you're looking at, you know, GI pathology as well. You're not going to become proficient in that, but you also need to be exposed to it. Yeah. If you're coming from anatomic pathology, then obviously you're going to be more focused in all term. Yep. So a typical day, I'm looking at slides. <laughs> I'm also, I'm oh, also, yeah. in the, I'm also in the clinic. Let, let me look at you. Get naked. Um, pathologists, dramatic pathologists, also, you know, we help out with say most surgery. We're looking at the the slides, and most surgery is. Um, performed by most micrographic dermatologic surgeons that do fellowship training and they cut out skin cancer and they do it in a way that's very precise. And at the same time, they're doing frozen sections on that tumor and they keep cutting until they can see all the tumor is out. And then they close it in a very beautiful way, like a plastic surgeon would probably better. And then you're able to go home and it's all the same day. And that's really the best cure rate for a lot of the skin cancers out there. One of the things that is my favorite thing to do though is teaching the residents and med students about pathology and, and germ path in, in particular. So this is, um, um, I'm also an assistant clinical professor of dermatology at uh, UC Irvine. And I love teaching the residents about germ path especially when they come to me with a case that they've seen in clinic and then I'm able to show them and correlate with them, you know, what they saw in clinic uh, on the patient with the, the pathology and really bring it home to them. 
So I have cases if anyone wants to see any cases. Let's do. I'm going to I'm going to ask if if you want to come on and and speak with us and try to answer some of these questions, we can we can get you on. So raise your hand. Um and again, there's a little bit of delay. And and as that is happening, Brian just said this is such an awesome experience. I'm now interested in pathology, which I wasn't before. Oh my god, Brian, that's awesome. Go. That's awesome. By the way, so on Instagram, I'm at OC Skin Lab. Feel free to send me any messages if you have any questions, if I can help you out, if you 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 know want any sort of input or anything like that, just let me know. All right. Um, so I just added yeah. Mariana on to <clears throat> the uh, the stream. Let's see if she can jump in. So go ahead and okay. Um, so case, case one, we'll they're here. pretty fast cases. So Case one is a 47 year old male who came to me with a new onset, just mildly itchy rash. No one likes to use the word rash, by the way, it's dermatitis, but we'll put rash for now. Um, sent by his primary care doctor. So patient is otherwise totally fine, good health. So when this patient comes in to you, what are some questions you might ask? So Mariana, you are here. What questions would you ask? <laughs> Um, I would ask if he has um, come in contact with anybody with another skin rash that looks similar or if he's traveled outside of the country. Excellent questions. Excellent questions. Those are fantastic. Any other, anything else you'd like to ask? Um, I guess I would take like a history and I would be curious about the patient's history if it's like a recurring rash. Perfect. Yeah. So I think those are awesome. I always kind of start at the top. So how long has it been going on? Right. So you always want to know the timing. Is it brand new or has it been there forever? And then then you're going to want to ask those questions like what could have brought it on? So medications, new medications and medications that they're already on. This is a big thing in dermatology. A lot of people will say, well, I'm, I'm on this medication forever. It's never had any problem before. But not every medication has to be new. It can be an idiosyncratic reaction. It can happen any time. Uh, it's not dependent necessarily on the, the duration that you've been taking it. Um, many times it is, but not always. Anything new you've put, put on your skin? And then has anything made it worse or better? Are they putting anything on it? And like you've already said, has it happened before? Any travel history, and I think this is very important too, any sexual partners, I think that's also important. Cool, so in this situation, I won't necessarily tell you exactly what the answer was <laughs> until we go through this. So I ended up biopsying, and I think this is important. So you need to understand what a biopsy is, and I'm sure most people have heard about a biopsy. Basically, you're taking a little piece of tissue. You can take a punch biopsy, which is like a little cookie cutter cylinder of skin out, where you're really looking at all layers of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, the lower dermis, and then the fat underneath. Um, so it's really important when it comes to like lesions that are considered inflammatory, like a rash, like a dermatitis. It's very important to see everything. Or you can just shave it off, and that's a shave biopsy or sometimes a scoop biopsy. Um, really good for things that are sticking up and you can just kind of cut it out like that. Okay, so I ended up, I was very lazy on this on this case case because it was the end of the day add-on and I was like, don't have time to do a punch biopsy and put a stitch in. I am gonna be quick and dirty and I'm gonna get underneath it and I, I shaved it. I'm sorry, I know this is really bad. Um, so this is, <laughs> I don't expect anyone to understand what this means. It's a lot of pink and purple and this beautiful. is- Beautiful. It's beautiful, right? And this is um, ink on the bottom. I always ink my, my tissue to know where the bottom was where I cut out. So this is the top layer, which is called the stratum corneum. This is what flakes off, kind of, that's your dry skin sort of. This is the epidermis, that's the top layer of skin. This is the dermis. And all of these crazy blue cells in there, that's inflammation. These end up ended up being plasma cells. I don't know if anyone has heard of a plasma cell. I know, sure you have, but it's a type of immune cell. And so the plasma cells are all over the place. And 
whenever I see a brand new rash in someone who has a new sex partner, I didn't say so that was the, the history. I always think of something called syphilis. Yay. So yay, syphilis. <laughs> yay for syphilis. Um, <laughs> it's making a comeback. And <laughs> so this, all these little red things here, this is a specialized stain. This is an immunohistochemical stain, which basically means that the stain is attaching. It's like an antibody going to an antigen. And then it has a little chromophore or something that changes the color when it does bind. And then it, it produces that red color. That's the dye on there. And that means it's labeling all of those little beasties in there. And those are the treponemes, the, that syphilis. Oh. That is awesome. And Where are your condoms, folks. <laughs> well, yeah. And then, <laughs> of course, of course, this is pre COVID, by the way. And I shook the patient's hand. Not that I'm going to get syphilis. They did not have active lesions on their hands. Even if they did, it would be very hard to get it that way. I would really have to like get some friction going, which I'm not going to. So um, it was safe. I'm not going to get syphilis from touching. But that's like a typical sort of case that I get. And I, I see patients in the office. I do biopsies, but I also get a lot of biopsies from other people in the community, whether they're primary care um or dermatology doesn't matter so they'll send me their biopsies from my interpretation so i will do both okay and now this this is a patient that came to me an older gentleman with about four months of this persistent dermatitis or rash okay he is on a lot of multiple medications he's older usually it's like you know hypertension that sort of stuff being treated by his physician assistant for about four months for what was considered ringworm, which is like a fungal infection. Um, I don't have any like real questions on this one because I wanted to kind of get through it, but it's not ringworm. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> really? After four not, months? Sure? Right? Hello. <laughs> so, I mean, I am not going to get on the whole like, doctor versus you know pa thing but if it's not working maybe there's a reason so yeah. we need to address that is it actually an eczema is it actually something else and i did a biopsy in this case again i don't expect anyone to understand what the hell all this means but you have again epidermis you have the dermis and you have all these little cells i promise you it's not another syphilis um <laughs> So all these little cells are going up into the epidermis. And when you get really close and you look, all of these are lymphocytes and they're atypical looking lymphocytes. So there's a problem here with the actual lymphocytes themselves. This ended up being, um, sorry, this ended up being a um, cutaneous T cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. So right. if something is not working, and a lot of people who may be on this call who are going into say primary care of some sort, it's very important to um, either biopsy or refer, refer out for biopsy or evaluation from dermatology if you have something that is suspicious or not getting better. Um, if you just kind of stay on it and, and not get an answer and you're just throwing medication, topical medication on it, one, it may change the biopsy. So it's harder for a, a germ path to make a diagnosis, or you're going to be missing something like this, which is actually a, a, a cancer. It's a lymphoma. Or, so, you know, not, not the best. You always want to be more proactive. Okay. So a, a student, a student li looking at that, and, and I have this question, I look at that and I go, well, that looks almost exactly the same as case one. How the heck can you tell the difference between <laughs> between those? Yeah, um, so yeah, yeah. Is it just different stains and you look closer and, and like you're really picking apart the nitty gritty? So you go to residency and you realize that <laughs> <laughs> you realize that the cells, the 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 lymphocytes here, they're they tend to be more um, darker, atypical, like shaped. They're also lining up in a way that should not 
B. And of course, I am not going into the full picture, right? But you do other stains to make sure that they are um, aberrant, so that they're atypical sort of lymphocytes. So there's immunohistochemical studies that we do. We send it to for molecular study as well to make sure that it's called a monoclonal, which means it's all one clone. So all of these lymphocytes are kind of coming from one lymphocyte that has freaked out and become cancer, and then it multiplies. So I can make this diagnosis without all of those necessarily because they it does look bad. Um, and I maybe just do a couple of stains to, to figure it out. I don't always have to do a molecular really expensive um, study, but a lot of people do and you can, and that's a confirmatory thing. Um, in this case, I did a couple of stains and I didn't need to really go over the top. But again, it's looking at thousands and tens of thousands and, and cases and going over it with, with your attendings. This is part of your, your residency. Okay. Um, now, yeah, exactly. This is super important, I think, for everyone to know, even if you're going into PATH, you're going into whatever you're going into, okay? So this case, I don't know, there you go. A 31 year old lady who with a recurrent pigmented lesion after it was removed by an esthetician. Never good, okay? Never let anyone other than a board certified physician take off anything that's pigmented. It's really, it's really disconcerting what I see in the community. I see people who have no training taking things off that are should not be taken off like that. Yeah. Okay. So of course I biopsy it and it ended up being a melanoma and with positive lymph nodes. This is all too common. And it's not just say like this random esthetician that takes it off with her little device that she got online, but it's also, you know, not necessarily primary care doctors who think that say it's a benign lesion and they they freeze it, thinking that it's like this, you know, called a barnacle or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then lo and behold, it comes back and and it was actually melanoma. I've seen yeah. that many times. So again, when in doubt, if you are going into primary care, it's very important to refer out or biopsy it yourself. It's really not hard. Um, part of what I do also is going out in the community for primary care doctors who do want to do biopsy and they want to know how to do it. I will show them how to do it. I will show you how to do it because it's hard sometimes to get in to see a dermatologist. And a lot of the times, at least in Southern California, they're busy doing Botox and um, all the other cosmetic stuff. So it's hard for them to see, um, to get in to see the doctor for a skin check. They're usually seeing their nurse practitioner or PA. And I have seen these things missed. And I'm not saying that they they are bad. I think they're great, but I have seen it, these things missed very often. And it's unfortunate. And you, you made a point to say pigmented lesion. Now I'm assuming kind of the melanoma part is here is the the pigment is from melanin, right? Mm -hmm. The things that gives us a tan and um right. all that fun stuff. Is that is that where the the kind of pigmented lesion is the worry yeah and it doesn't i mean you can have an amelanotic or not pigmented lesion as well so that's that can be tricky and i think many people can miss those not just you know a pa or, or a primary care but <clears throat> basically you're more likely to get the correct diagnosis if you do see someone who sees these things all the time like i said doesn't have to be pigmented and and even if it's pigmented, doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It's yep. it, we look for certain things, certain characteristics to to biopsy if it's um, higher risk, but the definitely ABCDEs. doesn't have to. What's that? The ABCDEs. The ABCDEs, and I like to add F to it. Oh, F fun, now too. F, yes, I like to give an F. Um, it's it's funny looking. So. Mm it's different than the the ugly duckling. So it's different yeah. than the rest of the moles. That's very important. Okay, okay maybe one last case. I yeah, don't know if anyone wants it. Okay, one more. 40, 45 year old female with new onset lesion of the belly button. Funky looking, no history. You wanna know the history, right? So um, 
when this patient comes to you, have you ever had anything else, any other cancer, anything else internally? Of course, all those other things that we went over, right? Duration, anything new, all this stuff. Is it itchy? Is it painful? This ended up being a metastatic breast cancer. We already knew the patient had breast cancer. This is a Sister Mary Joseph nodule. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. So it's the metastatic lesion that goes to the um, goes to the belly button. It's really cool. Anyway, it's sad. It is really sad. It's metastatic breast cancer. But again, this is also why dramatic pathologists that are coming from dermatology also tend to need to get more, a little bit more training and more of the general pathology because they may look at this and not know what it is because they are not coming from pathology background. So they don't know. If I was looking at this, I, I mean, I would stain it maybe, but I know that this is breast cancer. Um, so not everyone is going to have that background unless you're a path train. Um, but you can throw what, some stains on it. What's what's the the physiology behind breast cancer going to the umbilicus? The skin. Like that? You know that's interesting. So it's not just breast cancer; it can be any cancer that okay. goes to the to the belly button. I don't know exactly if there's like some remnant there that that's like it's tracking along there. I'm not really sure. It's usually. Um, it's not always breast cancer. A lot of times it's like a GI tumor, but, um, it's not, it's not a pathognomonic lesion. No, 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 yeah. mm -mm, no. But, but can't metastatic cancer to the umbilicus is that, um, sister Mary Joseph nodule. That's like the other name for it. Awesome. Okay. This is me. This is my getup when I'm in the, in the, um, clinic, this is my papper. So I like, I was wearing like a respirator to see patients and going home every day with a migraine. So I ended up getting a papper. I was on a long wait list for it. And I'm super duper safe when I see my patients. This was my Dolly Parton challenge that I'm pretty sure I won on Instagram. <laughs> Love the Tinder one. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then oh. this, these are like some great, some great um, path based Instagram mm. accounts. I heart histo. You don't have I heart histo on there. You know what? I didn't put I heart. Histo on. I should. I'm sorry. I left it off. I should put it on I right love now. I heart histo. Unless unless there's some like evil uh, like conflict between you two, and then I won't. <laughs> there's no rivalry. Let's start this. Let's start this rumor. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I heard? No. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh my god. Very cool. Well, hopefully, uh, some more students are interested in pathology. We need pathologists. We need we need that uh, part of our physician force out there. So hopefully some more people like Brian who mentioned earlier that he's interested in in pathology that uh, more people are going to come. That's my Let hope. me know if you have any questions. I'm I'm always around. I'd love to help out students. Awesome. Okay. Well, Dr. Harry, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your knowledge of uh, dermatopathology you and all of these fun slides and uh, your Dolly Parton challenge there was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Ryan. It was and awesome.